Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Charles Coburn in Barry Fleming's Colonel Effingham's Raid on the Hallmark Playhouse. Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars and outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present our dramatization of an excellent novel by Barry Fleming called Colonel Effingham's Raid. This is one of those stories that are exciting in themselves and also give us a very stirring concept of what America and Americanism can mean. Colonel Effingham was not only a great gentleman, he was a good citizen, which is sometimes much harder to be. And there's a very warm appeal in this story of how boldly and unexpectedly he had ventured into the affairs of a small American town. A gentleman, a citizen, an adventurer, and also a character. Not a bad mixture for any man to live up to, and I think you'll agree that we couldn't have done better than cast for this invigorating role that really great actor, Charles Coburn. And now, a word about Hallmark Cards from Frank Goss before we begin the first act of Colonel Effingham's Raid. At Christmas, as on every memorable occasion, you'll take special pride in sending Hallmark Cards. Because just as for hundreds of years the word Hallmark has been the distinguishing symbol of quality, so today the Hallmark on the back of your greeting cards is your assurance of finest quality and perfect taste. It's a symbol of quality all who receive your cards will quickly recognize and realize you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Barry Fleming's Colonel Effingham's Raid, starring Charles Coburn. The year 1940 was noteworthy because of two events. Europe was embroiled in war, and Colonel Effingham, retired after 35 years of service in the army, returned to his beloved Fredericksville with the fond dream that here he could find peace and contentment. And he did succeed until he entered the office of Earl Holtz, editor of the Daily Leader. It was then that his raid began. Get me Albert. I don't care where he is. Find him. Excuse me, Mr. Editor. Did you say Albert? Yeah, I didn't say Sweet William. Albert's my cousin. I'm Colonel Effingham. W.C. Born Effingham. Colonel, United States Army, retired. Congratulations. How did you get out? Get out? Believe me, sir, I didn't leave willingly. Yeah, I know. They shot you out of a cannon. Now, look, I'm busy. I've got to get out an editorial about Pud Tulin and why they're changing the name of Monument Square to Tulin Square. Sir, did I understand you changing the name of Monument Square to Tulin Square? Why? Well, what difference does it make? That's the way the boys want it. The boys? Are there gangsters here? Gangsters? No, no. The boys are the machine. You know, the, the political mob. And these gangsters, I, I mean, uh, this mob proposed to... Why, they ought to be court-martialed. Now, look, friend. You can stand by and compare the relative values of a certain Mr. Tulin to our Confederate dead. Monument Square stands in their memory. I like my job. I always listen to the boys. What's this plan to change the name of our honored square? It's trifling with our sturdy history. I tell you that the spiritual soil of Fredericksville is rich today because yesterday its citizens plowed into it their toil and their blood. Yeah, that's yesterday's news, old-timer. But you just made a better speech than the mayor will make when he dedicates Tulin Square. Now, look, I've got to get a paper out, and I don't... There's something about this situation that has a familiar ring to me. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. While I was on duty in the canal zone, I coped with exactly the same problem. Mr. Editor? Uh, pipe down, Colonel. Can't you see I'm working? Mr. Editor, how about uh, the possibility of a war commentary in your paper? No, no, no. I couldn't make it worth your while. I can get a syndicated column for about $3 a week. I'll beat that price. I'll work for nothing. Well, that's not a bad offer, but... You can't refuse me. Why, I'm an authority on war. I come from a long line of authorities. My grandfather served at Shiloh and Chickamauga. 
My father was too young to go. When Beauregard fired on Sumter, he was only nine. Yeah, that was a little young. But he stayed home and made bullets. I was at Santiago. I was wounded in action at San Juan Hill. Yeah, that's enough. I couldn't stand another battle. Okay, we'll call your column on the firing line. On the firing line. Not bad. Why, I was thinking of that very title myself. Well, Colonel sure picked himself a nice house, 98. House? Well, Mr. Albert Ron, yeah, we don't call this no house. This is Fort Effingham. You may enter, sir. Yeah. What's going on here, anyway? The colonel presents his compliments, sir, and says, will you kindly join him at the readout? Readout? What's a readout? You don't know what's a readout, Mr. Albert? Frankly, no. Well, sir, a readout is, uh, 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 a readout is... Well, all I know is I came to work here a month ago and I was already promoted to top rank of book private, 98, retired. Orderly? Orderly. Mm. Have you read the orders of the day yet? Yes, sir. Srem Canal's own for dinner. Cousin Willie, you're a celebrity. Boss wants some more pictures of you to run along with the advanced buildup for on the firing line. Wonderful. It's vital that I get that sort of buildup. Oh, no. Now, look. You retired from the Army. Why don't you relax and spend your time having fun with your friend, Clyde Manahue? What kind of picture would you like to shoot of me? Uh, well, you haven't by any chance got a dog around here, have you? Orderly? Yes, sir. Orderly, is there a dog on the post? There's old Buck, Colonel. Hmm, I don't know him. Live down yonder in the holler. Well, have him report immediately. Yes, sir. Cousin Albert, what's your stand on the changing of Monument Square to Tulin Square? Well, that's the difference, just as long as you're healthy. My boy, you're not aware of it just yet. But you've gone to war. You're fighting in the Battle of Monument Square right alongside of me. What war? We won't let the enemy change the name of Monument Square to Tulin Square. Cousin Willie, I'm a coward. Find yourself another soldier boy. I learned when I was a kid never to fight City Hall. You mean you'd submit to tyranny and the dictatorship of political bosses? Yep. There's nothing you can do about it. Oh, isn't there? I've already struck at the enemy's concentration. I refuse to wait to repel their charge. You did what? I've written my first column. It'll hit them like a B-27. It's on the streets now, thanks to you. Thanks to me? I didn't lift a finger. I, you didn't have to. I, I did it for you. Cousin Willie, what did you do for me? I helped you strike the first blow at tyranny, my boy. You're a hero. Just how did I do it? Well, I didn't think my article would pass the censor. And you being assistant editor, and particularly my cousin, I was uh, reasonably sure you wouldn't mind my putting it in your outgoing box marked uh, urgent print. Oh, no. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. And it was printed. Colonel W.C. Bone Effingham's the f- On the Firing Line has fired its first broadside. <laughs> Cookie, I want to see. Sit down. Yes, boss. No, stand up. It'll be easier to throw you out. This is fabulous. I write a front page story advocating Tulin Square and the virtues of Pud Tulin. Colonel Effingham, your cousin, editorializes on the next page down with Tulin Square. Let Monument Square live forever. What have you got to say about it? Well, you inherit relatives. You don't choose them. You're fired. Yeah, well, that's not news. Uh, no. No, no, you're not fired. If I fire you, the colonel's liable to quit. Oh, oh, you mean you're afraid of the colonel? Why not? Did you ever hear of the United Daughters of the Confederacy? They're picketing Monument Square. Our subscribers have been burning up the telephone, commending the colonel's stand. Egad, what a horrible thought. Don't let him out of your sight. Don't let him see anything in town. I have a feeling this is only the beginning of Colonel Levingham's raid. Cousin Albert, I'm a grown man. There's no reason for you to be holding my hand. Cousin Willie, I feel safer when I can look into your eyes and see the pretty blue. What's on your mind? Now, don't clam up on me. There are trees along the Champs-Élysées. Trees on Under Den Linden. There ought to be trees on Monument Square. At ease. Next thing you know, you'll be getting involved in that courthouse. Now, look, Cousin Willie... What's wrong with the courthouse? Forget it. Pay close attention to me. The boys don't want any trees around Monument Square. 
For years, the leader has kept the issue out of print. Now, tell me something. Where do you get your information? Did you ever hear of G2? Intelligence, man, intelligence. I warn you, you'll get fired. Don't worry. It can't happen. I'm indispensable to Mr. Hutz. How do you know? Who told you? No one. That's the way it happened in the canal zone. Oh, did I ever tell you the story? No. And I don't want to hear it. All I ask of you is to remember not to say the word trees. Don't even look at them. Well, but uh, the picture, if you will, uh, in a circle about the shaft of Georgia marble, 13 live oak. I won't say the word. One for each member of that glorious alliance of state. You're out of your mind. You're growing senile. Senile? Well, it's a pleasure to be getting old, Cousin Albert, because now I can say many things I've always felt, but mm, for one reason or another, was scared to say before. Bite your tongue. When a man gets up to 60, there's no use saving grouches. Forget philosophy. You're not going to mess with the trees. I want to know where you're going. All right. I'm going to have a conference with the mayor about planning those 13 T-R-E-E-S. Colonel, my secretary said you told him you were connected with national defense. Exactly, Mr. Mayor. The defense of America is the nearest thing to my heart. Now, what I want to discuss with you is the desirability of certain trees on Monument Square. But what's that got to do with national defense? The same thing as making sure that your lines of communication and supply are properly defended. Our communications must be kept open all the way back from the front line of democracy in Europe to the smallest courthouse in the nation. If they are cut at any point by tyranny... We are lost. There is no threat against the courthouse. It's just so old and dilapidated, it's endangering the lives of the county employees. What is that about the old courthouse? <clears throat> Confidentially, we're tearing it down to make way for a new one. Oh, I see. That's what Cousin Albert wasn't trying to tell me. You can't tear down the old courthouse. Why, you may as well tear down the statue to our Confederate dead on Monument Square. What did you say your name was? W.C. Bourne Effingham. Colonel, United States Army, retired. Oh, my gosh. First, we'll take up the matter of the 13 trees to be planted around the statue on Monument Square. I'll tell you what you do. You talk to Mr. Clemmer, the city engineer. I, I, I couldn't do a thing without his approval. And the moment I leave, you'll give him his instructions to send me to the planning board, who in turn will send me to the streets and drain department, who will send me to the parks and tree commission, and who will send... How did you know all this? Well, that's the way it happened in the canal zone. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, when I leave here, I'm going to stop at the first hardware store and buy myself a good shovel. First thing tomorrow morning, I'm obliged to plant 13 trees around the statue at Monument Square, personally. And when I finish with that job, Mr. Mayor, we'll discuss the matter of tearing down the courthouse. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Colonel Effingham's Raid, starring Charles Coburn. If you could ask one of America's favorite poets to write your Christmas cards for you this year, wouldn't you be pleased? If you could send the warmth and glow of Christmas in messages like this, may the joys of Christmas tide fill the home where you abide, and throughout the year to come, may its walls with gladness hum, peace and plenty. May these two fill your home the whole year through. This very message by Edgar Guest, along with a selection of other greetings, are yours to send this Christmas. They await your selection at the friendly store where you buy your Hallmark cards. Twelve cards with greetings especially written by Edgar A. Guest, and with Christmas snow scenes so realistic, you'll almost hear the crunch of the snow underfoot. And just because they are Hallmark cards doesn't mean they need be expensive. The selection of twelve Hallmark Edgar Guest cards are yours for only one dollar. Other Hallmark box selections, including a special box for the kiddies, are yours for as little as 50 cents. All have the Hallmark on the back. It's a symbol of quality. All who receive your cards will recognize and realize you cared enough to send the very best. Now, back to James Hilton and the second act of Colonel Effingham's Raid, starring Charles Coburn.
like a blazing beacon atop a lamppost rested a neon sign, which boldly spelled out Monument Square, which Colonel Effingham gladly paid for out of his own pocket. And around the Confederate statue were planted 13 trees. The Colonel had won his first victory. And now, with a copy of the Daily Leader under his arm, his eyes blazing, he bursts into the office of Mr. Earl Holtz, his editor. Mr. Editor? Oh, why do I deserve you, Colonel? Look, I've got connections. I can get you back into the army. You wrote this headline, Mr. Editor? Yeah, I have that distinction. It says, courthouse declared unsafe. Repair is not practical. Suffering catfish man. Don't you know that George Washington slept there? I wish I could forget it. You propose to tear down these stones that have looked on Lafayette, Webster, and Clay? This monument to our past? This embodiment of our common memories? This tablet on which we have engraved some chapters of our long story? This act is itself is unthinkable, but the mere suggestion of such a thing is indecent. That's the message I have for the people, and you're going to print it. My lord and master, no. In that case, I formally resign as war commentator on your paper, and I shall sell out to your competitor, the Daily News. Yeah, that's the way it happened in the canal zone, am I correct? Excellent reconnaissance. Colonel, the courthouse is in dangerous condition. It can be repaired. I'm afraid it's too far gone for that. Who says so, may I ask? Well, the boys have the say-so of the two best structural engineers in this section. Oh, the boys say so. And when they build the new courthouse, they'll split up the graph. Oh, no. I'm bringing my own engineer. Major Hickok, United States Army Corps of Engineers. But, Colonel, you can't ask the county council to accept an opinion of an engineer without a license. I don't care what the county council does. Major Hickok will make his report for the information and guidance of the citizens of Fredericksville. You'll print every word to that effect. Yes, Mr. Editor? Oh, my lord and master, yes. <laughs> Afternoon, Mr. Albert and Mr. Manny Hughes. Hi. What's that shooting, 98? That's the colonel, sir, picking off snipers. Get him. Who'd he get? That tomato can on the fence. Oh, oh no. 98, will you tell the colonel that Mr. Clyde Manahue and I beg the presence of his company and not to shoot till he sees the whites of our eyes? Yeah, here he comes now. Orderly. Oh, oh uh, hello, hello, Cousin Albert. Hello. Clyde. Hello, Willie. I'm glad to see you, Clyde. You're my oldest and dearest friend. Thanks, Willie. I want to thank you for your interest in the library. The piece you wrote in your column was very heartening. Why not? Every human is interested in the public library? Exactly. We've been trying for years, as you know, to get enough money from the county council to do a little painting and repair work. We're on the brink of success. I am very glad. The other day I was speaking to the boys, and I was delighted to have found them so cooperative. Splendid. They'll believe that they'll be able to obtain a grant for the repairs from the WPA. The opportunity we've been working for all these years. What got into the boys? Well, of course, they couldn't offer to cooperate with us without naturally expecting some cooperation in return. Well, they felt that the proposition of repairing the old courthouse is impractical and undesirable. Really? Yes, and they felt that the writer of uh, On the Firing Line should drop the courthouse controversy and temper his criticisms of them with a little more mercy. Well... The whole thing about it is, Willie, the old courthouse is gone. There's nothing to gain by continuing the controversy. While by ending it, the library will get the improvement. It's no use, Clyde. I couldn't possibly do it. No. Maybe I could have done it once in my early youth. I don't know. I, I did some pretty foolish things. I'm sorry you won't see this thing realistically. Idealism is all right in its place. Idealism is everything. Without it, you go stumbling along in the dark from day to day. It's your match in the dark tower. Romantic, then. Whatever you want to call it. Come on, now. There's nothing more romantic in any of us than to think we are not. We are such stuff as dreams are made on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This old courthouse belongs not merely to the citizens of today, but of yesterday. Those citizens who stood victorious with Captain Rudolph upon the ragged terrain of Fort Frederick. 
It belongs to their children and their children's children. It belongs to every citizen who has trod the streets of Fredericksville before us. And it belongs to the citizens who will tread the streets after you and I are gone. Quiet, please. Quiet. I have submitted the report to Major Hickok, which clearly proves that the courthouse building can and should be repaired. I make motion that the chair call for a rising vote of those in favor of reserving the courthouse. Yes. You're out of order. The WPA will not loan any money for the repair of the present structure. However, I can say that we have been granted a loan for the new building. Preposterous. I can only repeat, Colonel, I am as deeply grieved as you are to see the old edifice removed, but what can we do? The WPA will not loan money for repairs. Why are we wasting our time? Yeah. Let's get off this on that WPA money stock building. We want a new building. Now, I move the meeting be adjourned. Yeah. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Yeah. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Don't be stampeded! Listen to me! This old courthouse is a symbol of what we fought the revolution for. It represents a heritage of free government, handed down to us through the perilous years. Listen to me, please! Don't knock it down and throw it out for something streamlined! Come back and fight! Let's fight! Out. Cousin Willie, meaning no disrespect, I I hate to see you be a rabbit, heading lickety-split across a field wide open for the boys to take three shots at you. Thanks, Albert, for your advice. But it seems to me more like a rabbit to sit cowering in our nest. I'm getting fed up with all the shooting and the boys. I, I must say, Cousin Willie, I admire you, even if you are a loser. Mr. Editor, I have absolute proof that the boys are bilking the citizens. Here in black and white is a sworn statement from the WPA that they have never refused a loan to repair the old courthouse. So what? It's your duty to print this news. Now relax. As long as I run this outfit, your name or your news will never be printed. You're a passing fan, Colonel. The people have run out on you. Now get out. John, it's your duty to write a letter to the paper and tell them to print this statement for the WPA. I'm sorry, Colonel. Won't you help me, Tim? Got enough trouble of my own. No. Please. You've got to. You've got to. No. 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 Come in, Willie. What's on your mind? Hello, Clyde. This is really a coincidence. I was just signing a letter that might interest you. It's to the War Department. Is that so? Let me read it to you. I'm 64 years old, in good health, and I offer myself to be used as a soldier to fight the tyranny of Germany and Japan. I feel the time is short before we go to war, and it is my preference that I receive frontline duty. You have no idea how pleased I am that this is the way you feel, Clyde. I've been looking in vain for a citizen with your spirit. What's on your mind, Willie? I want you to write a letter to the paper as a private citizen, calling for another public meeting in the light of the new information I have from the WPA. You're my last frontier, Clyde. You dare ask me to write such a letter? It's nothing, Clyde compared to the rigors of actual combat that you are ready to undergo? This is indeed poetic justice. You said you were made of dreams, and the Lord knows you spoke the truth. Hello, Cousin Willie. You here to watch him blow up the old courthouse? came here to pity me, didn't you, Cousin Dalton? No, no, to comfort you. Because you're a great man. The greatest I'll ever know. Are you all right, Cousin Albert? Oh, fine. You know, I have a feeling more people have heard and believe in you than you think. But from the way they're cheering over there, it's hard to believe. Will you come to the house for lunch? No, I'm sorry, I can't. This is goodbye, Cousin Willie. 
I've quit the paper. And the boys get a stranglehold on decency and news that's fit to print never sees daylight. Well, what is there to say? I'm glad to hear you say that. I've joined the National Guard. We'll be leaving in the morning. I'm proud of you, Cousin Albert. Proud that you'll be among the first to fight and protect our country from outside tyranny. You have volunteered to serve your country in war. And when you return, you will volunteer to serve your community in peace. I'll be standing right alongside of you. Albert, you've given me courage to continue. Just so long as there is one person who believes there's a chance. You know something? We'll fight for good government. Because just as nature's wealth comes out of the land, its true civilization comes out of its government. If we neglect them, both our wealth and our civilization will go down the drain. You see, our fathers and forefathers, by their blood and toil, created the fertile history of this country. They were strong, and we will be strong too. We'll fight them, Albert. We'll fight them, and we'll win. Charles Coburn and James Hilton will return in a moment. When you choose cards on which to have your name imprinted, you make a very important choice, for that one card will represent you to all your friends. You can easily find the card that you will be proud to send by looking through Hallmark albums in the friendly store where you buy Hallmark cards. Ask to see the Hallmark Gallery Artist Album. When you turn the pages, it's like having the paintings of a renowned art gallery pass before your eyes. And there's also the Hallmark Blue Book Album, a collection of entirely new and different Christmas cards. Surprise effects, lovable Santas, cards with the spiritual beauty of a Christmas carol. Just look for Hallmark on the cover to be sure your cards have that Hallmark on the back. It's a symbol of quality all who receive your cards will quickly recognize and realize you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Colonel Charles Coburn, may I compliment you on a fine performance on tonight's Hallmark Playhouse. You've given us a highly entertaining evening. It was a very pleasant tour of duty, Mr. Hilton, a privilege which I hope I can repeat. You've been very helpful, too, tonight, Mr. Goss, because, to be perfectly frank, I'd forgotten all about selecting my Christmas cards until you mentioned it. Well, thank you, Mr. Coburn. I'm sure I don't need to remind you that when you're looking for your Christmas cards, not to forget to see the wonderful Hallmark Gallery Artist Christmas cards now on display. I most certainly will, Frank. And I want to see those Edgar Guest cards you mentioned earlier. That's fine, Mr. Coburn. And now, Mr. Hilton, will you tell us about next week's show? May I invite you all to be listening next week when we present one of Hollywood's foremost actresses, Miss Irene Dunn in Bride of Fortune by Harnett T. Kane, a very moving love story. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday, our director-producer is Bill Gay, our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray, and our script tonight was adapted by Jack Rubin. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Watch for Charles Coburn's appearance in the Paramount picture, Mr. Music, starring Bing Crosby. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present Miss Irene Dunn in Hornet T. Kane's Bride of Fortune and the week following Lou Ayers in A Letter to Mr. Priest. And the week after that, Thanksgiving Day, we will present Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's The Courtship of Miles Standish on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.